Ciao, this is Will Hunt from Evanescence, and you're watching and listening to Lean Your Rock. Hi, Will. Hello. Welcome to Milan and welcome to Linear Rock. Grazie. <laughs> Good to have you here. So you come to Italy very often, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, did this huge love for our country start, you know, during the Vasco Rossi gig or even before that? I think it started with pizza. Okay. When I was five, probably. <laughs> I was like, that's got to be a cool country to go to. And they make pizza. <laughs> so, you know, simple things. Yeah. Okay. Then, do you speak Italian? Uh, all the bad words. All right. Yeah. So Those... a little bit. Okay. Those are always very well known. Oh, yeah. Of course. Okay. So when you started playing the drums, was it your vision since the beginning, you know, to approach this as a professional experience or you simply followed your natural instinct, um, which was your main motivator behind, you know, entering the right. music world. Um, I think that, I, you know, and I tell, when I do clinics and lessons or anything like that, I tell people, you know, really make sure that you're doing this because you love it, you know, um, because the business side of it is, is really horrible, you know, and I say that because it's, uh, it's just a very difficult business to be in you know it's i call it the wild wild west now it's, okay. it's just crazy but um i think when i was a kid and i you know i saw kiss you know when i was five on you know i think a a, tel a television show in the united states and uh -huh. um just you know of course visually you see that and there's fire and blood and all these things bombs it's right? incredible <laughs> yeah and and so really what i wanted to do is i wanted to play guitar i didn't you oh. know it wasn't drums Oh, really? Yeah, and then my dad, who's a guitar player also, um, he got me a guitar, but I couldn't get my hands around the neck to make it work. And uh, I, was just, I was like, I can't do this. But wildly, there was a pair of drumsticks sitting around in the house for some odd reason, I think from his band. And uh, I just started playing and naturally kind of you know, felt it. Right. And so then started taking lessons, and that's... Uh, that's that's kind of how it got going. Plus, you already had a guitar player in the house, so you exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was okay. surrounded by music um, as a kid growing up, and um, I mean, I didn't. I don't think at that point, when you're five years old, you don't go, "Oh yeah, man, this is it for me. The rest of my life, I'm going to be this." But I think by the time I was eight, I was starting to feel that way. So, so it was like a uh, kind of love at first sight for you when you first started to play the drums. You, yeah. you knew right immediately that that was your instrument. That, I knew it. Yeah, I could feel that. You know, it's one of those things that it just I gravitated to it naturally, and um, I didn't. It wasn't forced. Whereas the guitar at that time, anyways, was like it was very difficult for me. It was, it was forced, but okay. I just held sticks. It just felt right. You know. All right. So as you mentioned, um, we have a very special addiction in common, which is called Kiss Mania. Yeah. <laughs> and so which is which is your favorite Kiss drummer? Uh, I mean, you started because of Peter Chris or something. Yeah, like that? I, I, okay. I would have to say Peter Chris because, you know, back in the day when he was on, you know, he was really good, you know, um, and very different than and unorthodox than a lot of the drummers at the time. He yeah. came from a different, you know, background, and he played with this funk, you know, the, this kind of groove that right. was really cool. And he, the way that he did his fills and everything, he's like, you know, the guy wrote compositions, I think. And uh, a lot of people, you know, bag on him and say, oh, Peter Chris is horrible. And I was like, no, you know why? Because... When you hear Peter Chris, you know it's Peter Chris, and for a drummer, that's very hard to do. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the same thing I think with L Lars Ulrich, which yeah. I'm indifferent to Lars. I mean, I, I appreciate what he does, but I have to say it's the same thing with him. Whether you hate him or you love him, it's him. You, it's him. You yeah. know it undoubtedly, and you know what? That's that's the highest accolade I think that any drummer can have. Like John Bonham, Stuart Copeland. I mean, there's not many, yeah. but when you hear them, you know it's them. Um. You keep yourself very, very busy. Is it a choice or simply you cannot say no to all the offers that are made to you? <laughs> um, wow, that's a good question. I've never thought about that. <laughs> uh, 
I guess because I'm too busy. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that, you know, again, I love to play. And I'm always up for a good time and good playing and, you know, writing music or performing music or whatever. Um, you know, I have several of my own projects going on at once uh, outside of Evanescence. Um, and I, I don't know. I think I just do it when it when it feels right, you know, and it makes sense. I mean, it has to make sense. It's got to be something. It's either... I love the music that we're making. Okay. Uh, I love the hang, you know, with the All people, right. uh, and uh, or I love the money. It's got to be one of the three. <laughs> okay. You know? One one of them's got to be there. A good combination, by the way. A uh, great combination. <laughs> you know, if it's all three are there, then hey, you're winning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you you just finished recording an album with Gus G. Yes. Which just came out. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us more about it? And uh, actually, which was your role? Did you write your own patterns? How okay. did it work? Well, um, I met Gus last year, almost exactly a year ago at Music Messe, uh, which is like the big um, manufacturer's convention in Frankfurt, Germany. Yeah. And um, I was introduced to him from uh, our guitar player in Evanescence, Jen, who's German. And... Um, so Jen introduced us and I spoke with Gus because, you know, the common ground for us is that, you know, he played in Ozzy and I played with Zach Wilde. Okay. So, and we sat down in the hotel lobby, you know, not even drinking. I think we both had water in our hands. This is an evening, just cracking up, talking about Zach, telling Zach stories and <laughs> Ozzy stories. And I just hit it off with him really well. Um, one thing is that my, my stepmother is full Greek. She was born in Greece. Okay. Um, so I've got some heritage or some lineage there. And um, he's Greek. And so we talked a lot about that. And we just hit it off. And then <clears throat> I think it was... Not long after that, he hit me up and asked me if I'd be interested in playing on his new solo album. And I'm absolutely, of course, you know. Okay. Um, he sent me, he and the bass player, Dennis, who plays bass and sings on it and produced it and co-wrote it. He's a big role with Gus. Um, they sent me the demos and they basically they were just, uh, you know, patterns that they had programmed. But then once I got in there, you know, they had me do my thing, you know, my fills okay. and uh, change some patterns. And mm -hmm. um, I recorded the entire album in two days. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'm quick. Yes. I did, my, I did my homework. <laughs> yeah, I did my homework. Um, and I'm really proud of it. I think that uh, he's got, the, he just released the title track, which is an instrumental track called Fearless, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Um Kind of reminds me of a very heavy Joe Satriani in a way, okay. but just with, with maybe a little more soul. Um, but uh, he, and then before that, they released a video for, um, oh, what was the song, man? Uh, we'll find that out. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. trying to remember. God, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. But it's the first track on the album, and uh -huh. it's really, really, really cool. You know? It just came out on April 20th. So. Yeah, like less than a week or about a week ago. A week ago Friday. Will there be a tour after? Do you know He's that? touring now. You're going to go? Well, no, because originally I was going to do some dates with him in Europe, but uh, Evanescence toured right up to uh, the Music Mesa conference, and then Jen and I went straight there, and then he had already started. Um, okay. He had dates, so, so. you know, couldn't, couldn't make it. But I think, I think we're going to try to do something in the States together when he comes over there. So from how you're speaking, uh, I guess you still consider Evanescence your main commitment. Is that like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been in Evanescence since uh, 2007, okay. and um, got you know I have co I got I get to write you know I co-wrote um, some of the songs on the last album, and um, and even though the albums are spaced out, you know it's yeah. it's still. Uh, it's still, for some odd reason, I, you know, it's not by design, but some odd reason, I always wind up, you know, I'm there, you know. Um, and, well, there's a lot of reasons, but uh, we just put out an or orchestral record that basically is a reimagining of um, some of the older material, but it's very, very different than what, like, a lot of bands have done with or orchestra music, like, you know, Kiss or Metallica have done these orchestral records. But basically what they do is they play their songs and then they add an orchestra to it. Yeah. And Evanescence is already that. That's okay. what Evanescence sounds like anyways. So to do it, you know, Amy's idea was let's strip it completely down and then build it from the ground up. And right. kind of my role in it was playing a lot of electronic percussion and a lot okay. of electronic things. Um, on this current tour, I'm using an entirely electronic kit, 
Like there's not one microphone on it, and it's cool. It's different, but very different. Very different, yeah. But um, <laughs> especially for s someone that is strong as you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a definitely you All know the dynamics, you know, are, yeah. it's, it's very different. <laughs> very different, but it's also really challenging and really cool. One of the things about it is that you know these are different arrangements. So the difficulty was not learning um, the new arrangements. You know, like unwinding what I've known for. Right. Since 2007 on a lot of this right. stuff, or the last record. And, 11, uh, 12 years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, or the last, you know, the last five years. But um, that wasn't the hard part. The hard part was is that every single song, I have a palette of 12 different sounds. So it, it was really remembering, <laughs> okay, that's where the anvil hit is. Okay. That's where the explosion is. That's, you know, and kind of like... Also because visually they're all the same. Yeah, it's like so it, it's <laughs> right. And I'm using. I only have a certain number of inputs to use for the samples. So like I'm hitting symbols, but they're not symbols. Okay, so right. that might be a rim click, or that might be an explosion, or that might be this one hit right. that you know lasts four or eight beats. <laughs> um, and it's you know that was dicey in the beginning. You know that was what was hard. But apart from the fact that that's you know Evanescence, that's your own band. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you think that that genre? Uh, that you're playing with them is the in, the thing that makes you express the most, the best as a drummer. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, anytime I get to write, you know, I get to be a part of the creation, it's, it's absolutely that. Um, I think that with Evanescence, I do get a chance to do that. And even, even on this last album, which is, you know, very highly influenced electronically with the, at least the rhythms, um, I was able to, you know, add to that and do my thing and kind of still be, be a part of it. Yeah. I mean, make no bones about it. Everybody knows that Evanescence is really Amy's thing. I mean, it is a band, but what? she calls the shots, man. She's a leader, and, and I'm 1,000% okay with that. But, but that being said, you know, she wants me to, you know, expand my horizons she wants you know she pushes the creativity and i think that that's one of the alluring things about being in that situation apart from the fact that believe it or not like we actually all really get along like we like hanging out with each right. other Good. um i don't think there's that many bands that can say that uh especially after many years right and mm. i think well and then it goes to show you that you know we've taken a lot of long breaks so maybe that's got a little bit to okay, do with that it. Helped. <laughs> we're not living on top of each other all the time but um but yeah, I mean, we do get along, and we we like to hang out with each other. So it's a good it's a good it's a good camp. And being a, also a session player uh, makes it more as a job, uh, you know, than just playing with your own band, um, or actually, you know, sitting behind the kit makes no difference you know when you're there you, you just do it and you don't think you know I'm doing this for my band no this is a session or whatever how, how does it work for you everything's different I think that when it's your own band you know you're kind of relying on each other in the writing process and when you're in the studio as well as a producer you're kind of relying on each other to say hey try this or okay that's a little over the top maybe try something different or you know or encouragement like that's so cool man I love that and then you feed off of each other and that's that's kind of more the uh, original band side of it and the in the studio side of it as a studio musician you know these people bring you their songs and sometimes they're very attached to the way that they are mm -hmm. and you you like to think that people bring you in to do their albums because they want your flavor on it but i've definitely done a couple of things where bands have demoed songs for you know the, over the process of a year so they become very attached to the way that drum parts are and things are and um, so every situation is different. Sometimes they go, hey, man, like the Gus She thing, hey, man, do your thing um, within the confines of what we've got, you know. And then occasionally he said, ah, you know, change this, go back to that. But usually it was like, man, over the top, I love it. Um, but then some bands are like, ah, oh, man, you know, we really like it this way. And then like, you start to realize, and they're like, well, we like that this way too. And then the whole, it's like, so wait a minute, you just want me to learn the song exactly the way that you demoed it with the drum machine. And just play that, right? And it's pretty much, well, they never say yes. It's okay. always like, no, nah, not really. I mean, we want you to do your thing, but, and then you do your thing. Like, no, nah, but, you know, listen back to that. It's just like. So okay, then, so if it's good, you can add it. Otherwise, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a bit of psychology. You have to, like, go into things with this open mind and that you don't know what they, 
want or they don't want, you know. But doing so many different things actually helps you to keep it fresh and uh, learn maybe new things, yep, absolutely. you know, after so many years. Absolutely. Like one, I mean, and I, and I say this in the best way, but best way, but I did a record for a band that was, that did pretty well in the States called Crossfade. And um, yeah. <clears throat> I did their third record and I'm friends with those guys and uh, they had been demoing their record for more than a year. Yeah. And the guy that is the guitar player and kind of one of the main writers, um, very educated musician, Berkeley guy, and but also you know, with the genius comes the insanity, and he, and he, <laughs> we did a song on that album that I'm very proud of. It's the last song on the album, album called "Make Me a Believer," but it's, it's it's a little over ten minutes long. It goes in and out of different tempos and time signature changes, and it's it's really, really, really cool. But it was one of those things where I got in there, and you know they really wanted that thing close, if almost exact, to what the drum machine parts were. And um, that was a process, man. It was like it was overwhelming, but at the end of it, I learned a whole lot. I played some fills that I wouldn't have normally played, and now I have them in my repertoire. And, you know, you you take you take situations like that, and you you uh, you learn from them. You know, you become better. And what's more difficult for you um, to put, you know, Will Hunt's signature on, you know, when you play mm -hmm. on somebody else's music and, and, you know, make people understand that immediately that it's you or actually fitting, you know, uh, the project the way, you know, they demand you to do. Yeah. And uh, um, it, it's actually, I mean, maybe it's more natural to put yourself into it, yeah. but sometimes you have to follow some instructions or yeah. what is more complex and difficult for you? Maybe, you know. It's more complex to, to go in and um, it's more complex to go in and have to like repeat exactly what's what's on their demo. Yeah. You know, because then you're, you're, you're very meticulously learning these parts and these little hi-hat nuances or these little ping You know, it's, God, I'm using the cross. He <laughs> called the ride bell a ping. It drove me crazy. Um, it's a ride bell. I love you less, but um, it, uh, but anyways, you know and that 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 was how exacting that was. It's like you know those two pings on the end of the and and the eighth note. I mean seriously. Yeah. So that's 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 more difficult I, because I'm really kind of an in the moment guy. Okay. And uh, tend to kind of play things. Um, you know how how I'm feeling, you know, and then once I kind of get it formulated down, like I'll do a couple of passes of a song, start to feel things that I feel really good, and start repeating those things, and then usually go in and listen back, you know, and like, oh, that's cool, mm, no, so yeah. not so good, this is cool, you know, and kind of start doing it like that, and then building it, and then once it's documented like that, then you know, I, I pretty much stay on that. Tell me about this tour that you're doing these days in Italy okay. uh, with Rock Classics Revisited. Yeah. Uh, was it your idea? And uh, is it a trick, you know, to keep in shape while, <laughs> you know, while having a great time? Or actually you're trying to educate, you know, the younger fans to the classics? What, what's the, the meaning behind it? All of the above. Okay. Yeah, I can't. I, can't, I took a cue from Steph Burns. You know, he, Steph has been doing this type of a thing over here for quite a while. And um, Steph and I grew very fond of each other when I started playing with Vasco. I mean, I knew who Steph was, but I didn't know him. Mm -hmm. But we hit it off immediately. And he told me that he did this. And after the second year that I played with Vasco, it was like, you know, you could do the same thing. So just started doing it. And uh, it's been... <laughs> it's interesting because you, it's a mixed bag. Like some nights you get this incredible band, like last night... I play with this band and the and the singers, this guy Timothy, who was the second place winner on The Voice here mm -hmm. in Italy. And I've known about Tim, T Timothy for a while, and it was it was awesome. The band was great, he was great, and we had an incredible time. But sometimes you get guys, that you're like, and they say, "Yeah, you know that? Yeah, I know that song." And then you get into it, and like, "Are you sure you know that song?" <laughs> and then by that point, it's you know you've jumped out of the plane. <laughs> you know you can't. You know, get back in the plane at that point and stop everything. You just got to go through it. So, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, when it goes well, it's a lot of fun. Um, when it doesn't go well, I've got some good stories to tell. Okay. <laughs> but you don't want to tell us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And who chose the set list? It was you. No, I mean yes and no. I mean it's kind of a mixed bag of people. 
you know, common things that a lot of people know makes it, you know, not overdoing it. And a lot of times what I'll do is, you know, I'll throw out a set of 30 songs, like, you know, pick 15. Wow. And then what will happen is I'll say, well, we, we got 10 of these, but then we play these other five. Maybe Or here's our set. Maybe you know some of these. And inadvertently, I always know some. I mean, I've been playing cover bands since I was 17. So, so. I, know, I know quite a few. Okay. Which There's a lot your, going your, on up here. Which are your favorite classics to play? Well, any 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 Led Zeppelin. Okay. <laughs> um, any Kiss. Okay. Uh, any Black Sabbath. Right. I mean, there's endless Van Halen. I mean, you name it. It's, it's, I think it'd be an easier question to answer of uh, what don't I like to play. All right. And apart from you on the drums, is it a different band every night? How does it work? Usually it is. Uh, okay. I The band that I played with on the first date I'm playing with again um, – I don't know what day I'm playing with them, okay. but I am playing with them again. So occasionally so, I had the same band. One time I came over here and I did a tour with the same band for the whole time. Okay. And that was a lot of fun because, you know, you could be a little bit more selective about the material. And then we rehearsed a couple of days and then it's every night, you know. So this awesome. time no rehearsal at all? You just go to no. sound check and... Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, and go. over let's a couple, go. maybe talk about it for a minute. <laughs> okay. Like, hey, this okay. is how we'll end this or whatever, you know. Wow. Uh, when you're a pro, you can do that. <laughs> you hope. Is that special for Italy, or are you doing it all over Europe? No, just Italy. I haven't just done this Italy. outside of Italy yet. Um, <clears throat> I've thought about it. Maybe Germany I might do some stuff in, but um, not yet. And tonight is a very special night, because you're playing a special tribute to Iron Maiden. Yeah. Uh, with Flesh of the Blade, which is an Italian tribute band. Why this special choice and how did it happen, you know, that this date is different than the others? Right. Well, so my manager over here um, asked me, he's like, hey, there's a gig uh, with Iron Maiden tribute band. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> like, I haven't played Iron Maiden songs since I was in high school. And it's fun, you know, it's just like, it's, again, I'm, I'm up for the challenge, you know. Um, one, one of the things about playing with tribute bands, whether it's an Iron Maiden tribute band or an ACDC tribute band over here, or Nirvana one, which I've played with, yeah. is that usually they're pretty on it, you know. They usually know their songs, so it kind of, it's like, it's really more on me to, to learn the material and not, you know, avoid the train wrecks, and which... I guess puts me a little bit more in control, so I'm okay with that. Okay. It makes it, it makes it kind of, it, uh, it idiot proofs it. <laughs> and um, so you, you don't like tributes or, or you actually, oh, I do. well, because you know, there's always this fight be, in between bands, you know, they do original music, they yeah. say that tribute on, you know, stealing the scene because all, all the clubs wants them to play. So there's yeah. this old story. What's your point of view on that? <laughs> uh, you know, I think that one thing that I've noticed in Italy is that there are definitely a lot of tribute bands yeah. and there are definitely a lot of Vasco tribute bands. Like that <laughs> to true. me is so bizarre. Yeah. Like, you know, Vasco's alive and well, man, and, and, <laughs> and kicking ass. And it's like, right. you know, there's... Five billion Vasco Rossi tribute bands, and I mean, I guess it speaks volumes to the love that people have for him because I guess they do pretty well. Um, but there's a lot of tribute acts in general in Italy. I mean, in the United States, we have tribute acts, but it's not quite as like this. Like oh. I actually have a, uh, a Nirvana tribute act in the states. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Nirvana. Okay. And um, we do it for a good time and. Uh, What's funny about this is that our singer, I mean, he looks and sounds just like Kurt Cobain. Actually, it's weird because you look more like Kurt than, than <laughs> Dave Grohl. So it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I know, it's very I weird. Know. <laughs> but I put the hat on backwards, you know, okay. and do that. And I'm kind of in the dark a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and then our bass player looks the part. And we've got we've kind of taken this to a, to a I guess if you want to call a, a, about a, as pro of a tribute band as you can get because we've got like the backdrops from the nirvana tours wow. we've got the props we've got all this we've took it to the highest level that you can take it to just like okay how good can we make this and are you um, playing small or medium venues i mean we play typically for 1500 to 5000 people a oh, night wow yeah i mean yeah. and that's the thing about it like you know kurt's gone you know yeah. unfortunately he's not coming back so this is a way for people to kind of get a, a taste of what that may have been like, you know, we're real especially conscious of, live because yeah. you can have the records, but or yeah. the videos, but 
feel it. Right, you know, yeah. I mean, that you see it. These people go crazy when we play, you know, and it, it's, again, it speaks volumes to how much love people had for that band and how that band's music just infects people. Yeah. I mean, it's like you go to this thing and we people are jumping and, like, you know, it's where Kurt Cobain's up there. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's fun and funny okay. <laughs> at the same time. Uh, back to the drums. Um, being technically prepared is always the key to become a successful musician. And how did it work for you? Uh, well, I mean, you, yeah, I think there's a saying in the States and probably here too, but basically that, you know, luck is being prepared when an opportunity presents itself. So it's, it's basically means like, okay, you never know when that shot's going to come your way. And the question is, are you ready or are you not ready? Okay. And if you're not ready, well, then there, there went that shot. And that might be your one and only shot, you know. So the key is to get yourself in a position where you're ready. And I think by the time I was 17, you know, I was ready to at least start professionally. And I got that opportunity. And, um, you know, next thing I know, I'm in a band, you know, a cover band, actually. But it was a big cover band. And we played, um, you know, five to six nights a week, three to four sets a night. You know, of everything that was big back then from Def Leppard to Whitesnake to Zeppelin, you name it. And we had a truck. We had a big light show. I mean, a full-size semi-truck. And a uh, big PA. And it was like an arena band, but in a club. And these guys were all older than me. I was 17, and they were 25, 26. And they were pro. Okay. And um, I would call. I did that for about four years. And I basically would say that that, that was college for me. That was university. Uh, because that's where I learned how to be a pro. I mean, but... I had the the beginnings of technical proficiency to even take that and for them to entrust me with it because right out of the gate, they were like, man, this kid's only 17, you know, can he even do this? He just, I just got out of high school. I mean, graduated a month earlier. And uh, they took a chance on me and showed me a lot, you know. I'll never, I'll never forget that. And the brain factor or the heart and soul factor, which predominates in your playing? Um, Definitely the heart and soul factor. Okay. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, but you also need to put the brain sometimes. So <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like, you know. Combination. Yeah, when you're writing, you know, it really comes from the heart and the soul. And then once you go in to listen back to it to see okay. how it is, that's, a good point. that's where the brain comes in and yeah. goes, okay, let's, let's, you know, let's evaluate this. And you know, is that over the top? Does that make sense? Are you <laughs> playing for the song? Yeah, I, I got to hang out with some really, really incredible drummers at Music Mesa. Um this guy, Ash Sohn, who's uh, Adele's drummer, and but has played on everyone's records. And this other guy, Gary Gary Walls, who's the drummer from Pink Floyd, but has also played for everyone, including Beyonce and you name it. And these guys are incredible. And sitting with these guys, um, one of the things that they kept saying was basically like, all right, if you're playing a song, play a song, right? And, but sing it while you're okay. playing. Okay. And if you can do a fill, you know, while you're singing it perfectly, you know, then that's probably where a fill goes. Okay. But if you can't sing it and play the fill at the same time, that means no fill goes right. there. I mean, that's that's oversimplifying it, but that's about as spot on as you can get. Wow. You share on the net a lot of drum cum videos. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it feel when you watch them and see yourself, you know, banging on those drums and um, watching and listening to yourself? What do you think is the peculiarity of your style? Well, I'm my own worst critic. So when I watch <laughs> that stuff, I'm going, God, that sucked. <laughs> no. You know, or I missed that, that <laughs> hi hat, you know. Pff, that was ridiculous. You know, it's never like, Oh man, I'm awesome. <laughs> I don't I don't ever look at it like that. It's usually um I'm critiquing myself constantly, you know, and then just thinking, okay, well how can I make it better? And you know, always thinking that way, you know. It's okay. never it's never God, I love myself. <laughs> it's never that. But you you watch them all? I mean, or you just at, you know, first 30 seconds and then you don't want to see it. Well, I mean, if, it, if, if they go up on YouTube, yeah. um, I've definitely watched it because okay. I don't want to put up something where I just have a huge train wreck, okay. you know. Gotta, I got to make sure that's legit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from your experience, do you think that boys and girls have a different vision and expression of the rhythm as drummers or percussionists? Hmm. 
Uh, I don't think so. I mean, mm. there's some really great female drummers out there. I mean, there's not a ton of female drummers in general, I and I don't really know why that is. Okay. Um, but, I mean, if a good drummer is a good drummer is a good drummer, whether you're male or female, it doesn't okay. matter. Like, there's a girl, there's there's a band called Skillet in the States. Yes. We're and um, yeah. they have a female drummer. Her name's Jen, Jen Ledger, I think is her name. And um, uh, when Device, I had a band with the singer from Disturbed, uh, David Draymond. Uh, when we were doing some touring, we did a couple festivals with Skillet. And, I mean, she blew me away. She, like beats the crap out of the drums and plays with so much soul and so much vibe and just, you know, incredible female drummer, you know. It's like you don't even think about her being a female. You're like, just, wow, you know. Sheila E? Do you remember it? Sheila E's a freak, man. She's incredible, <laughs> you know. There's a lot of rhythm going on there. Okay. Um, if you have to name your top three favorite drummers of all time, which ones would you pick? That's tough, man. I mean, uh, very hard. I mean, it'd be, I'm, you know, I'm leaving some people out if I, if, if I don't do this right. But um, certainly John Bonham, you yeah. know, certainly Tommy Lee. He was a huge, um, a huge influence for me before I ever even met the guy. Okay. You know, that's public knowledge. And um, I don't know, man, like the third place would have to be a toss up between a lot of different guys, whether it's Stuart Copeland or Morgan Rose or uh, Abe Cunningham or. Peter Chris, or okay. I mean, there's just, it's very hard. Okay, you named a few more than three. Yeah. Okay. You actually mentioned Tommy Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, you played with him on his solo stuff. Uh, how is it for a drummer to play for a drummer? And, you know, you're both amazing drummers. W what kind of experience was that? You know, what, there was more pressure in it for you because it was Tommy Lee? Um. No, because we're friends. That's okay. the thing about it with him is that, you know, you meet somebody like that. First of all, just to meet your heroes is, you know, a dream. You know, you never think that that's going to happen. So when you meet them, but let alone you're meeting them and then now you're playing in their band and now you're buddies, you know, it's just that whole part of it's surreal. But I think the fact that we were friends by the time I actually played um, on anything of his was... Uh, it made it very easy because we're just laughing, having a good time, like, you know, like one up in each other, like, dude, check this out. No, check this out. Because he'd played, I didn't play the whole record. I just did a couple songs. Okay. And, um, we just feed off of each other like that, you know. That's our, our friendship is based on rhythm, and we, we dig it, you know. And it's just, it's not intimidating at all. It's really more encouraging. And um, you talk about pushing the envelope. I mean, that's, that's kind of what goes on. Very healthy relationship. And do you have a special training or diet for drummers that you would suggest, especially on tour? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's kind of common sense, you know. Like, um, drink a lot of water. All right. You know, I do a lot of cardio, um, a lot of CrossFit training, which is like strength training, but also cardio at the same time. Um, because when I play, it's really physical. Um, You know, it's kind of like running a race. Less okay. so on this last Seven Essence tour because I'm definitely more reserved. But, you know, normal stuff for me is like, you know, my heart rate's up really high. And it's for a long time. Like with the Vasco show, it's two and a half hours long. And although I get a few breaks here and there, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of it that's very up. And you don't want to feel like at the end of a song or end of a few songs, like, oh, you know, you're dragging, like, it's killing me, man. You know, you want to feel like you got energy to burn. So... I think a lot of it is just getting the cardio up and also like some yoga, you know, to really keep limber. I'm older, so I need to really <laughs> <laughs> take care of my muscles and joints. Okay, last question. Okay. And um, uh, is there anything you really dig as much as playing drums? And what's next for you at the moment? Maybe some solo stuff yeah. to keep yourself even more busy? Yeah, so... Uh, what do I like more than playing drums? I mean, of course, hanging out with my family. Um, but... Um, I, I love being at the beach. I love being, you know, anywhere that's tropical, Caribbean, whatever, surfing, anything that's got to do with water and the beach, I am in, you know. And I think that for me is probably my end game is, you know, my wife and I landing up in a uh, in a tiny house in St. Thomas Island and 
You know, basically, I want to just, here's my deal. I want to be where all I got to do is put my surf baggies on and my flip-flops. Okay. And I can live like that. I don't all even right. have to put a shirt on unless wow. I'm going to go to the restaurant or the grocery store. And other than that, that's, that's, that's heaven. So that's, yeah. I'm, I don't enjoy that more than drums because I'm still going to play, but uh, at least as, as much. As much as drums. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. And then outside of that, um, I have a few projects. I have a band called... Um, I have a band uh, called White Noise Owl that's been out for a while. We've got a new album coming out. We've got a four-song EP out now. It's on Spotify and iTunes. And we've got a new song out now. It's also on Spotify and iTunes as well as a video. It's called Something. Um, and the rest of that record is probably going to be out within the next month or two. Okay. Um, and so then, it's ready. Yeah, it's ready. And then I have uh, another project called Rival City with um, uh, a singer uh, by the name of Jeff Goot who was the uh, runner-up winner on the X Factor in the United States. Okay. And um, the guitar player, uh, Gino Leonardo from Filter. Um, and that's really cool. And we've got an EP that's ready to go. We may extend that to a full length. I don't know yet. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, and then I've got another band, which is in the studio right now called Thirst. Okay. Um, which is actually, this is kind of funny. This is the guys that I have the Nirvana tribute band with. Okay. So what we have a whole other world of an original project that's not like Nirvana. I mean, it's there's a, it's a little grungy, but it's cool. I'm really excited about it. So that's coming at some point too. So yeah, I'm staying busy. Okay, great. So thanks, Will, for your time. Thank you. Looking forward for the show, and yeah. uh, hope to see you soon again to Absolutely. Italy. Absolutely. Okay. Right, thank thank you. you so much.